Brilliant. Okay. Just before I do my talk, by the way, and welcome to the new members, I thought I'd just mention this uh, event, which is being celebrated today. Um, it's nothing to do with astronomy, but he's one of my heroes, so I'm going to mention him. 27th of January, 265 years ago in Salzburg, Austria, when a star fell down to earth from heaven. It was Mozart. He was born today, 265 years ago. So I thought I'd mention that. Um, as I say, a metaphorical star, but I thought I must mention it. What I've decided to do tonight, my talk is called Starfish and Asteroids. I was going to put an astronomical free flow of consciousness, and I thought people might think that was a bit over the top. There's loads of astronomy in it, but I thought I'd do it as a picture gallery of astronomical images. And I'm just going to start the just first four or five slides just where the idea came from to do my talk. Um, asteroids is only coming into my talk incidentally. Um, I'm quite interested in marine biology and starfish have the Latin name Asteroidea. And that got me thinking quite a bit. Um, when I was a teenager, maybe uh, a few older people might remember there were a couple called Hans and Lottie Haas that used to do a TV series where they used to do deep sea diving. And they were a beautiful couple, uh, handsome uh, Hans Lott, Lottie, who was an Austrian naturalist, died in 2013, and his beautiful wife, Lottie. And I saw that, I thought, yeah, I want to be a marine biologist. Yeah, yeah, that's the life for me. And in the end, I didn't become a marine biologist. I ended up working in boots chemist, and then I progressed from there. But it got me interested in the fact with starfish, and I don't know anything at all about starfish except to mention one thing. Um, you'll notice the picture on the right is looking at it from the top when it's lying on top of a rock, and you'll see its mouth. Um, um, sorry, that's the, get it right. That's the bottom. The one on the left is looking at it from the top. So you'll see his mouth, its mouth is underneath, and its anus is where its mouth should be at the top. And I was thinking about that this afternoon. I thought I've known quite a few people in my life where it seems that way. It seems like the bottom is where the mouth is and the mouth is where the bottom is. Okay, starfish. If you look at the names for starfish, there's a clear astronomical connection. They're called sea stars, asteroids, five finger echinoderms and starfish. They come in all sorts of different sizes, but you can see the connection with astronomy, you see the connection with stars. Usually they fit into the human hand. And just before we go straight into the astronomy, um, a gentleman, a French zoologist called Henri-Marie Ducreté de Blainville um, first gave them the name um, Asteroidea for starfish in the year 1830. So that gave me the idea about heavenly bodies related to marine biology. And I've discovered um, 15 nebula, which I'm going to do, deal with first, that are all related to um, marine biology. Oh, sorry, just to mention, asteroid, obviously, it's from the Greek aster meaning star, eidos meaning form or likeness of appearance, therefore asteroidia, like stars, starfish. So let's look at some of the heavenly bodies that are related to marine biology. Well, you've got M38, M, if anybody doesn't know, refers to Charles Messier, who catalogued um, a number of different heavenly bodies that he didn't know what they were way back in the 18th century, gave them all a number. And M38 is the Starfish Nebula. You'll find it in Auriga, which um, I think I'm right, I will get corrected by somebody, I believe is roughly overhead at the moment, so you can see it. So I actually see it probably every night. But because I don't have my telescope out every night, I do naked eye astronomy, I'm probably looking at it without realising it's there. You've got the Crab Nebula, M1, the first in Charles Messier's list of objects. Um, and as I say, um, John Bevis, an English astronomer, um, first discovered it uh, way back in, in the uh, 1700s. It's a supernova remnant, first spotted by the Chinese in the year 1054. 
Um, very beautiful, whether it looks like a crab or not, it sort of does, but without any appendages or whatever. SH2, the dolphin um, nebula, this is near Cassiopeia. Um, it's quite beautiful, this picture, whether in fact th that's the colour that you'll see when you look at it yourself. Um, but it's sort of, mm, well, again, yeah, it's sort of like a dolphin. I think you have to use a bit of imagination. Now this one, clearly, the fish head uh, nebula, uh, which is round about the constellation Cassiopeia, I think it does actually look like a fish head. So this actually looks like what it's supposed to be. Um, so as soon as I saw that, I thought, yeah, fish head, can't mistake that. And then you've got the jellyfish nebula, um, which is also sometimes known as the sharpless nebula, if I've got the name right. And again, um, I've shown it from one angle, um, but I think it looks vaguely like a jellyfish. Um, many years ago, when I was about 11 years old, we went to Norway on holiday and uh, the fjord where we were next to had all these jellyfish and I took great delight and I'm sorry if I spoil it for anybody who thinks I was cruel to animals. Um, I actually took the jellyfish out and made piles of them, you know, um, which is not a very nice thing to do. But when you're 11 years, 11 years old, you don't really have too much of um, a conscience about doing things like that. The Lagoon Nebula, um, quite a beautiful one, uh, M8. Um, you'll find that in, um, I believe, in Sagittarius, if you want to know where you look for it, where to look for it. Um, and it's followed by one called the Lobster Nebula. This is very interesting because this is also known as the War and Peace Nebula. I believe it was the Earl of Ross, a famous astronomer, Irish astronomer, way back in the 18... 50s or 1860s who first gave it the name Lobster Nebula and you can see it's um, pincers at the front there, um, quite dramatic. And then you've got the Manatee Nebula. Um, by the way I forgot to say, I'm going a bit too fast because I'm aware of the time I've got, NGC stands for a star catalogue, there are different star catalogues which list things. I think this is called the National general catalogue, I might be wrong, but there are different um, things which you get the numbers from. Um, New general catalogue. It's the what, sorry? New general catalogue. Thank you very much, thank you for correcting me. Uh, I do apologise. Um, this one is the Manatee Nebula. Um, I'm quite fond of this because people unaware of what a manatee is, it's a large sea creature. This is a picture of a mother and a baby. Weighs about a thousand pounds. They've been much depleted in numbers over the years by human beings. You find them off the, uh, the coast of Florida. I, I couldn't believe it when I read it, but it said a lot of them have been injured fatally by uh, collisions with people in speedboats, which is a great shame. A, a lovely creature. It feeds on algae and seagrass. Uh, and that's the, um, the creature that the uh, nebula is named after. The prawn nebula, believe it or not. I actually was only going to have a few, but the more I, I looked at, the more I found that are named after marine uh, creatures. That's in uh, Scorpius. Um, the shark uh, nebula, um, which you can find in Cepheus. But there was an article I read this afternoon. I don't have time to go into detail about it. But apparently this article that was written for one of the astronomy magazines claims that it's difficult to see because of the, the dust in the nebula, actually makes it not an easy um, nebula to actually see. Um, but when you do see it, clearly you can see the shark's jaws up on the left-hand side. The giant squid nebula, which is sometimes known as the flying bat nebula. And again, that really is quite accurate. That's exactly um, what it looks like. The Stingray Nebula. Now, when I first saw this, um, this is um, one that you can see. You won't see this one because it's in a southern uh, constellation called Ara or Altar. So you won't see this in the northern hemisphere. I thought, hang on, I've seen that before. I and mean, if you go back to the first one I started out with, starfish, it's very similar. But you'll notice starfish clearly has um, five or six um, appendages 
Whereas if you look at the one I've just shown you, it has four, stingray, nebula. Um, I've seen a stingray and I, I find, somebody will correct me on this after I finish speaking, it doesn't look like a stingray nebula to me, but the stingray rather, but that is the, the name it's actually managed to, to, to get. Then you've got the turtle, which clearly looks like a turtle, NGC 6210. Um, and that one is in the constellation of Hercules, which I can never remember. Somebody will tell me straight away. It's either on the left or the right of the summer triangle. It's on the right, is it? Right? Come on, hurry up, all these experts. I think it's the right hand side of the, the um, just to the right of the summer triangle, um, which you can see bits of the summer triangle even at this time of year, okay? Um, you've also got the whale nebula, NGC 4631, um, which is seen in a, a, a very small constellation called Canes um, Ven, Venatic, Ven, I can't pronounce it right, Venatia, I think I pronounced it right, the, the hunting dogs uh, constellation. Yeah, okay, um, sort of a whale. Um, blue it, whale. A blue whale, thank you very much, yes. Steve, thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah, um, so there, there you go. And the last one, which I really wrongly called a nebula, is actually a galaxy M51A, NGC 5194, the Whirlpool Galaxy which allegedly was the first galaxy to be classified as a spiral galaxy. And you can see the spiral shape there, very, very clear. Okay. So I thought you might like this picture actually of people who've actually drawn it over the years. First of all on the left, Herschel, but I don't honestly know whether that's William Herschel or his son, John Herschel. Then you've got the Earl of Ross did two sketches of it, one in 1845, and one in 1850, and there's um, a modern one, okay? Whether it's actually changed or whether simply that um, Herschel drew what he, he could see and the Earl of Ross could see a little bit more detail, um, whatever, but I thought you might like to see those sketches of it. Okay, some constellations now. Aquarius, the water carrier, yeah? I apologise because I meant to um, have a picture there without the lines in it. I do apologise. Um, but you will notice on the right of the picture that um, the, uh, the water carrier has his left foot on Piscis Austrinus or Austrinus with the star um, Fomalhaut, I think I pronounced it correctly, which I'm going to mention again at the end of the talk. Uh, Capricorn, the sea goat, and you'll see this very um, fanciful picture here from an old star atlas um, of um, Capricorn. Cetus or Cetus, the sea monster, sometimes called the whale. Um, there's a fairly um, frightening picture there, but I thought you'd like the following picture there, but it looks quite cuddly. Um, whether people see it, well, Weather. if it's a whale, um, quite unusual to have feet. Um, although there is evidence that whales are descended from um, creatures, dinosaurs, so they may have had feet at one time. You'll see it's just south of Aries and uh, this case. Uh, walk, walk him up. Mammals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but you'll see it's um, quite a, a, a wonderful, wonderful picture of, of that constellation. Delphinus, the dolphin. Um, you might look at the picture on the, um, the right, which shows um, Aquila, the eagle, which again is part of the summer triangle. You've got uh, Delphinus at the left, and you've got Aquila, uh, this, uh, the archer down at the bottom. Um, people must have very strange ideas in the past of what a dolphin actually looked like, because um, it's got a nice swishy tail and, and, and whatever but I thought that was quite a nice picture. Hydra, the sea snake. You will see a number of other constellations shown there. Um, Corvus the crow, I think Noctua is the, uh, the, the owl. Um, you've got the, that strange looking object, because I'm not sure what it is, but you've got a sextant, sextance at the, um, at the top right. You've got um, 
Hydra, the sea snake itself, Felis the cat, obviously, and Antlia pneumatica, which is an air pump, which I was surprised to find, um, if somebody wants to argue with me, I did check it out, is actually part of the 88 modern constellations recognised by the International Astronomical Union when they decided on the 88 constellations back in 1922. Pisces, or Pisces, pronounced properly the fishes, and I've put that in um, capital letters because a person that you may know quite well is actually um, born under the sign of Pisces. Oh, it might be me, in fact. Yes, in, in fact, it is. Um, two fishes swimming in opposite directions, which means we don't know what the hell we're doing. Uh, we're mixed up and we, we can't decide what we're going to do. Um, that's a picture where you've got the fishes superimposed on the top of the, um, the constellation. Thought you might like this picture. Some very insightful person put this on the internet. Very, very insightful and truthful. Pisces character, that's me. Very tolerant except for liars. A true friend and a great lover. Very good, but I don't know how you know that. Um, <laughs> secretly wild and crazy. Sweetest if treated well. Gets along with many types of people, but has a dark side you don't want to mess with. Amen. That's uh, amen, my wife is just saying. <laughs> Um, that's a picture of my pre-lockdown party last year, um, with new people coming into the party and showing their respects. Um, and I thought you might like to know, of course, that um, Albert Einstein, believe it or not, just to show that Pisces is the best sign in the zodiac, I was born on the 13th of March, and hey-ho, he was born a day later, not in the same year, of course, way back in 1879, on the 14th of March. So I just thought you'd be... Uh, impressed by that. Um, this is um, a southern constellation called Piscis Austrinus, the southern fish, uh, and I thought I'd mention that because the star formal hout, or formal hout if I pronounce it rightly, actually I, I don't know if it's not what, know what language it is, I've forgotten, means that the mouth of the fish and that particular star is 13 times the brightness of the sun. So to finish off, I thought I'd finish with Neptune, the god of the sea. Um, one of the largest planets in our solar system, the eighth planet, if I've counted correctly, um, a blue planet, um, and it's named after the god of the sea, known to the Romans as Neptune and Poseidon to the Greeks. Um, Neptune has, has rings, but apparently they're quite dark, so it's difficult to see them and you cannot see Neptune with the naked eye. You have to have a, a telescope for it. So, come all the way from the humble starfish, which is what I started off with, and my interest in marine biology. Um, and I hope you'll see that what I've said relates to, to that interest. I also started off with a picture of Whitby, and I've got that lovely picture of the night sky looking across um, past Whitby Abbey. And if my geography is okay, which my geography is not my strongest point, the building in front of the Abbey, if I've got the right building, but I might not have got the right building, is actually um, a pub and a brewery. And next time you're in Whitby, um, when the lockdown ends, I recommend that you go there. Maggie and I went there uh, a year or two ago with my grandson. The most beautiful home uh, brewed ale, absolutely superb. And you get a chance to look out at Whitby Abbey. But I just want to mention, um, last of all, that a few years ago, Maggie and I were in Whitby and we're on the other side, the West Cliff, this side near where the Captain Cook monument is. And I was very disturbed when I was um, getting the picture to find out that um, uh, the Captain Cook monument has had to have people standing guard over it because these people want to go and tear it down because they believe that Captain Cook has an association with um, slavery, which is a very tenuous thing, uh, really, a bit controversial, I know that. But a few years ago, Maggie were in, and I were in Whitby, and Maggie and I, believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe, it actually had words. And I went down on the beach, and I was walking on the beach by my own, and I suddenly noticed something. The tide was coming in, and I very nearly um, got caught by the tide, in which case I wouldn't have been able to give this talk to you tonight. Um, and I managed to get up the ramp, up the steps, 
And there were a load of people just to the left of where we are here with telescopes. And I wondered who they were. And it was Whitby Astronomical Society. And I spent a lovely hour with them looking through the telescopes. And it was lovely looking at constellations um, over, the, over the North Sea. It was absolutely amazing. Um, a lot better than looking at constellations sometimes inland. So I just thought I'd like to get a picture of the stars over the North Sea. And I couldn't find the one I wanted, but I got this lovely one of star trails. Um, basically, I believe this is the harbour on the left-hand side, right at the end. Um, and I just thought it was an amazing photograph. I don't know who took it, but absolutely uh, amazing. So hopefully um, you've enjoyed the talk. And I want to finish off with a nice little rhyme that I found on the internet. I don't know who Strad Hanjali Lenka is, but it's a lovely little verse. It says, the stars, the moon, the sea, and your hand in mine. And I hope I've done that, that I've managed to combine my interest in marine biology and astronomy in the talk that I've just given. And with that, I'll say, thank you for listening. The end. Very good. <laughs>